uh, meeting slash webinar, and I think it shows with the with the large number of participants we're going to have joining us here. So, and it appears that we've opened this up, Elma, uh, Maya. So we'll wait a minute for everyone yes. to get settled and join us, and then we'll go ahead and get started. So, let's we'll yes. wait around thirty seconds or so, or maybe even less. All right, let's go ahead and get started here. Um, welcome everyone. My name is uh, Joe Gogler. I am the director of the Bold Building Our Largest Dementia Infrastructure, Public Health Center of Excellence on Dementia Caregiving. Uh, I am a professor here in School of Public Health at the University of Minnesota. And I just wanna thank our wonderful group of panelists here, uh, the many members of our center who worked very diligently to uh, pull this webinar together. And then, of course, for you, the participants, we're looking forward to what I think is going to be a really fabulous and uh, insightful set of presentations and conversations revolving around uh, diverse perspectives um, as it relates to aging, as it relates to living with dementia, caring for someone living with dementia, understanding how stigma operates in these uh, heterogeneous contexts. And, and most, most importantly, how we can better acknowledge, address, and assist uh, people living uh, optimal lives, uh, as well as living with dementia, in a way that's uh, both humble and supportive as well. Um, next slide, please, Alma. I think it's very important for us to begin our uh, time together today with a land acknowledgement. The University of Minnesota Twin Cities is located on traditional, ancestral, and contemporary lands of indigenous people. We acknowledge with gratitude the land itself and the people. We take to heart and commit through action to learn and honor the traditional cultural Dakota values of courage, wisdom, respect, and generosity. And I really want to highlight uh, the Dakota values here of courage, wisdom, respect, and generosity. I think you'll find uh, that our wonderful presenters today, as well as the discussions and conversations we'll have, will uh, certainly adhere to these uh, very important values. Next slide, please. So uh, the real leader of pulling today's webinar together is uh, what's called the Health Equity Task Force. The Health Equity Task Force is a core component. It is a leadership component of our bold Public Health Center of Excellence on Dementia Caregiving. Um, these are uh, This is a group of national uh, renowned experts that help us always ensure that health equity is at the forefront of all the work we do. Um, how we consider public health actions and supporting uh, dementia uh, de uh, uh, caregivers of people living with dementia and how we always keep our eye, always keep a lens on uh, diverse perspectives, racial, ethnic, socio-demographic, and socioeconomic. So I really want to acknowledge uh, the great members of the Health Equity Task Force, Jason Resendez, uh, Dr. Lauren Parker, uh, Dr. Fayron Epps, and particularly Ocean Lee, who really took uh, uh, the lead, was the lead of today's webinar. Um, next slide, please, Alma. So Ocean, I'll turn it over to you. And again, thank all of you for attending today. Thank you to our wonderful panelists. Ocean, unfortunately, we can't hear you. Is this better? Much better. Thank you. Awesome. Sorry about that. Uh, I just want to say thank you, Doctor, uh, for providing opening remarks on the CDC Bold Public Health Center of Excellence on Dementia Caregiving and highlighting some of the work we do, uh, such as this very important webinar today, to learn more about the experiences of diverse older adults living with dementia. Um, as you can see, here's the list of panelists that will be speaking today. Uh, the purpose of this webinar is to educate those in the aging space, as well as anyone who may be interested in brain health, about the unique experiences of diverse older adults living with dementia and mild cognitive impairment. Uh, we'll hear both personal stories of those living with dementia, as well as a presentation outlining the findings from a recent survey on experiences of those living with dementia. Um, uh, with that being said, you know, here are the panelists. We have Andrea Roberts, uh, her son Kevin Britton II, uh, Dave Baldridge, 
and Ginny Bigger before finishing off the webinar with a QA uh, session. So with that being said, uh, I want to introduce our first speaker, uh, Andrea Robert, who has been living with mild cognitive impairment. Um, I would like to add that Andrea is such a great person and individual who has really helped the Public Health Center of Excellence on Dementia Caregiving to understand how we can do better to support those living with mild cognitive impairment and or dementia. So uh, without further delay, take it away, Andrea. Good morning. Um, I want to thank Kelsey um, for allowing me to participate in this webinar. My name is Andrea Robert. I currently live in the state of California in a small town called Claremont. It's about 45 minutes east of Los Angeles. I have one grown son. His name is Kevin. I only have one child and you'll hear from him later. I also have a little dog named Little Chanel. I am 57 years old, currently living with mild cognitive impairment. My, co my mild cognitive impairment is really related to um, TBI, um, a history of traumatic brain injury, um, PTSD. Um, and then also I was diagnosed originally for um, early onset dementia in 20, 2017. And that was really a baseline for me. My final diagnosis was selective cognitive deficiency secondary to multiple traumatic brain injury. And so I suffered from brain injury as a child. Um, but what really um, started affecting my memory is what, um, and I think it was 2001, I had some type of paralyzation and I remember I was next to my bed and before I knew I was lying on my bed. And so I don't know if I suffer from a stroke or a seizure. And I noticed then that I started having some, a little bit of decline in my memory. At the time, I also thought I was a particular medication I was taking, I was taking um, Zoloft. And Zoloft, um, from my opinion, what I read about um, when you're winging yourself off, I was winging myself off with the direction of the physician and I noticed I started having some cognitive issues. So I don't know if it was the medication. I don't know if I was under a tremendous amount of stress. I don't know if it was the stroke. I don't know what it was that caused me to start having some decline in my memory. Um, I would say even with the decline, I, I'm pretty much 100% function on my own. I mean, I, I live alone, um, living with this condition, which is a challenge by itself. Um, I have put services in place for myself. So in the event that my son needs to advocate for me, everything is already in order. Um, some of the things I had to do, I had to downsize. I had three houses. I was managing two and I was doing a lot of different things and I had some, some debt. So I am debt free, no properties. I'm living in 55 plus community. And I have subsidies that bring um, some of my, um, you know, my financial responsibility down. And so in, in the event that my son have to jump in, those things are already in, in order. Um, I live in, a, again, a, a 55 plus community, which makes it even less stressful for me, which is very important for my cognitive um, functioning. Um, I feel safe in my community. You know, if I walk my dog every morning. If, if there's a week and no one sees me, someone is going to do a wellness check. Um, so that helps a lot in regards to um, a lot of my um, stressors. Um, I'm going to be looking back and forth at my notes. But um, my mild cognitive impairment, again, is, is, is more associated with, um, you know, um, more brain injury, not so much brain changes. But I it, but my experience and some of my daily, um, I would say some of my daily limitation and impairment, it pretty much is like someone that's living with um, other cognitive um, issues like, you know, dementia or Alzheimer's. Um, so, you know, I, like I said, I don't know exactly why I start having memory issues. I was still working full time at the time when I had the paralyzation, either the stroke or the um, ischemia stroke or the seizure, I was working as a flight attendant. So I was flying. Um, I continued to pretty much work up until 
I want to say 2017, I was, no, 2019, I was working as a massage therapist and I got laid off because of COVID. I was working very, very little hours because I needed to work in order to keep my, you know, cognitive functioning, um, you know, um, healthy. So I've always worked, but my work schedule went down from maybe 30 hours, literally down to like maybe one to 10 hours a week. Um, but I don't think I, I can't work full time. It's too, it would be too much. Uh, and because of some of the memory, uh, it's really hard for me to understand complex instruction. And most of the time for me to go into work, or to start a new career, I have to be able to get through the orientation, get through the training. And um, that's a little more tougher for me. It's always been an issue because of the, the brain injury, um, but now, you know, having a brain injury and, uh, you know, some of the memory issues um, it's become really hard. Um, I would say some of the things that I'm challenged with on a daily basis, if you were like a fly on my wall, some of the things you would see in my apartment is that I like I have everything scheduled. I have to live within a routine. If I get off my routine, it causes anxiety for me. And then it causes possibility of me forgetting something. So if you walk into my apartment, my apartment may be symbolize someone like a reporter where they have their, you know, they have their reports or their you know, interviews in, 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 in place. So sometime if I need to remember something, I have to keep things out. I have to keep my files out. I have to write in my calendar every month. This is, I have to pay my bills. I'm very efficient with paying my bills. I'm still efficient with budgeting. I can budget my money down to a minute, uh, to a penny, but I have to put on my calendar that my bills are due around the 15th of the month. Um, I keep erase bars, um, sticky notes, uh, things like that. Okay. I've been told I need to move to the next part of it. <laughs> so um, the one of the other um, points were uh, in regards to um, how did I get through my, um, the process. I was very fortunate. I had really, really good insurance. And I had a really good neurologist. I self-referred myself because, like I said, I had a history of um, memory issue as a child. And so I was really tired of struggling with the limitation that I had. And at the time, I wanted to go back to school and take some classes. And I knew I had to have paperwork in order for me to get some of the disability um, services in regards to accommodation for me to be successful as a student. So... Um, my first set of diagnosis was with a neuro, uh, was with a psychologist. And so um, at the end of the day, she basically was saying that I was having some, I had le learning issues, but I also was starting to have some memory decline. And at the time I was working for the American Red Cross as an instructor trainer, and it was becoming more and more challenging for me to remember um, my, um, my, my lesson. So I was responsible for uh, providing um, instruction, instruction to uh, participants. And every time I would do a class, I would have to study everything over and over because it was hard for me to, to kind of put things in order. That's the most challenging thing is trying to put things in order. And so again, my neurologist was very good. Um, he was an, a young neurologist. He initially, like I said before, diagnosed me with early onset, and that was basically a baseline. And from that, um, after two more um, exams, um, he finally um, diagnosed me with um, basically mild cognitive impairment and um, TBI. But the, I think the most challenging thing in regards to my um, neurologist is that um, I was given the, the diagnosis. I had the report in front of me trying to understand again that um, complex information, I had to ask my neurologist why he was explaining my diagnosis and the report to me. Um, I had to really advocate for myself and um, let the neurologist know that I needed him to, uh, to like slow down while he was talking to me to help me understand what does um, mild cognitive impairment mean 
what the prognosis is because I was going to my um, appointments on my own because my husband, you know, he had to work. And so my, and my son was um, in college and he might've been out of state at the time. So I went through this whole process um, uh, alone. So it, it was hard in regards to personally going through it, but in regards to getting good care and having a good neurologist, it was important. And at the same time, because I advocate for myself, I have no problem with, if I don't feel comfortable with a neurologist or I feel that he's not really looking out for my best interest, I am really good about going back to my insurance and looking to see if I, if I can find a new neurologist. Everybody don't have that, that, uh, that capacity to be able to advocate for themselves and um, know that if they don't have a, a good team of people that's helping them, that they do have the options of finding someone else. So my experience um, was pretty good. In regards to uh, my family and stigma, I had to look. I had to look up what stigma first of all meant because sometimes I hear these words and they don't really under. They don't really make sense to me um, in general. So stigma pretty much mean um, a mark, disgrace, blemish, um, shame, and I would say that in regards to family members. When I am with my family member, for the people that know, um, we're not really having a conversation about it. And I would say that my son may not really know. He knows that mom is not 100 like she used to be. Um, so we do have conversation in regards to, you know, what are some of the things that I want to be done in the event that, um, you know, maybe I have a stroke and then I may have um, memory issues. But I'm thinking about maybe being in the presence of my family, like maybe a, a cousin, and we're just not, I think the stigma, the stigma come is a person may not feel that I'm on the same level as them. And they may feel like the conversation with me may not be the same. And that's not true. I'm still pretty much the same person. But if a person assumed that I have cognitive issue they may think wow she's not uh, um, she's not able to understand anything and that's not true um sometimes it's hard for um, family members to open up the conversation for different reasons they can be going through their own, own thing their own challenges maybe they're afraid to to you know bring the subject up maybe they're just not um educated or they don't have the knowledge to understand what a person is going through but for me being young with my um, condition, I'm pretty much the same person. I function like pretty much everybody on this call today. Um, I do have my limitations. Um, and I think people just, they're afraid. Um, and I want to say that in order for agency to have people, family members talk about stigma, stigma agency also need to deal with stigma because Sometimes there's stigma in regards to services, you know, being, um, you know, a person of color, being a person and um, considered un un unrepresented or um, a person that is considered marginalized. To me, those are stigmas, stigmas too. So we're dealing with stigmas from agencies as well as family member. And I think agencies can do better in regards to dealing with stigmas in regards to me as a person, as an individual, to help me or help family members deal with stigma, stigma um, themselves. One of my issues that I have in regards to memory is um, word pronunciation and also word finding. So um, this is me in raw, raw form, but um, stigma is, is you know, it's, it's something that everybody has um, and, it's really hard to address, but basically, if you don't have a common interest with someone, people don't feel comfortable. If a person feels like I'm not with them cognitively or um, academically, you know, or sociably or financially, there's always going to be some type of stigma. And so um, I think minds may come from someone assuming that I'm not able to cognitively 
um, communicate with them on the same level. And that is not true. Um, you know, that, that's farthest from the truth. Um, but I want to let people know that all the services that are in place for me, I had to self-advocate for myself. And that is so important. A lot of people do not have that skill. Um, they have to rely on someone else within their family to help them navigate to, through things. And because I'm still young, uh, I'm still vibrant, I'm still active, you know, I, I'm feisty and I know how to advocate for myself. And if I'm not represented a certain way, then I can speak up for myself. And that helps a lot in regards to making sure the services that I need are in place so that I am less a burden to my son. And it was really hard work. It took me 10 years to um, downsize. And I think this is something that everyone needs to do is to downsize because you, you don't know if you walk out the door tomorrow, you have a stroke, you know, or something happened to you where you have, you're not, you're not, um, and, and you're not responsible for your own care. So I would encourage people that, um, you know, it's something that we all have to do, but, you know, self-advocating, um, if the person is not comfortable with whoever they're seeing, they need to either advocate for themselves or have someone advocate for them. And um, we'll talk about more in regards to my son and bring up, you know, he's more of my care, he's more of my care support, um, not a provider. Um, he's very, very supportive of me. Um, and he looks out for his mom. I have to tell you this real quick joke. So when my son and I are together, um, he's always looking out for me. We have a conversation. What do you want to do when X, Y, and Z happen? But I notice when I'm with him sometimes, he'll look at me and we're out in public and he'll look at me and he said, mom, you got to go to the bathroom. And I'm like, dude, I'm not even at that point. And I don't think he realized that he does that sometimes. Um, but son, I, I haven't gotten at the, I, I'm not at that point yet, but I, I thank you for looking out for your mommy. And so um, you're here for my son, but like I said, he is a great um, support. Um, and, you know, he looks out for me as a mother. So thank you guys. Thank you, Andrea, for sharing your story. Um, I'm sure many in the audience, including myself, I've learned a lot just from listening to your experience. And so thank you so much. Um, like you said, you know, uh, Kevin is there as a care supporter. Um, and next up is Kevin, who's Andrea's son and is a part of our care team. As an, uh, and I was also an associate at Dorsey and Whitney. Uh, Kevin will talk more about his experience being there for his mother as part of our care team. And so with that, take it away, Kevin. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Kevin Britton. Um, I guess it's not allowing me to start my video, but um, I live in the Minneapolis area. I am a, a lawyer, a new lawyer um, to Minneapolis in Minnesota. I work at Dorsey and Whitney in the trial team. I think you can see me now. I work at Dorsey and Whitney in the trial team uh, downtown. Uh, I went to Virginia Commonwealth University. I majored in philosophy and political science. I then went to uh, Howard University School of Law in Washington, DC. And then I moved to Minnesota for the Dorsey and Whitney position. And so, um, yeah, my mom, she, she has the cognitive impairment. Growing up, like she said, she functioned pretty well. And then I did start noticing some decline I remember one example, it was just midday. It was prior to me going to college and she just all of a sudden just forgot who she was. And it scared me because I, I had never encountered a situation like that. And I just remember her saying, I don't know who I am. I don't know where I am. And I just, at that point I just sort of froze because I didn't know like how to respond to that. But what it did do was motivate me during that gap in time, I decided to go to the Red Cross and, and, and do CNA work. And they sent me to the VA in Richmond, Virginia, and we worked on the dementia ward. And um, that was my first experience working like closely with people that had dementia. And, you know, I've seen 
dementia symptoms on TV, but I had never experienced it in real life. And I remember there was one patient where I had a full conversation with him. We were talking about life. I told him my name and everything. And then like the very next day, he didn't remember me at all. And it was like a recycling of all the information that I had told him prior. And it just, it just really hit home how devastating that illness can be. And then it further reminded me of what happened to my mother and the possibility of her one day becoming, um, you know, having those type of symptoms in her life. Um, I think as far as, you know, like I, my mom said, I, I try to be as supportive as possible. Like she goes to school and I tell her to take advantage of all the resources that are available to her. So, you know, she can, she do well, perform well in school. And I hope that, you know, my own academic journey has been an inspiration to her as well. She's always been a, a supporter for me, There's always been graduation football games. She's always been there. So I feel it's my responsibility, you know, the cycle of life um, to take care of my mother, just the way she took care of me when I was younger. And so, um, you know, it's difficult because like I said, I live in Minneapolis. I'm starting my career as a lawyer in a law firm and my mother's in Southern California and all my family out there as well. And so I think when it comes to these cognitive issues, it's, you know, having to make those personal decisions of, do I need to go home? Do I need to stay where I'm at, build my career? And so it's that tug of war. Um, but like I said, at this, like she said also, at this point, she's not that far gone to the point where she cannot take care of herself. And she is in a position in Southern California where most of our family is at. So it, it gives me a little less um, guilt is what I feel most of the time because I'm not close. And if something does happen, but you know, I, I guess, like you said, we, we have those conversations of if this, then this, and you know, I just have to, it's a tough situation dealing with cognitive impairment, dementia, because you feel hopeless or, or rather helpless sometimes because there's nothing that you can do to cure the situation. All you can do is support and care. And then when I'm so distant, it makes it, you know, like I need to call more. I need to, you know, like, am I calling enough? So there's a lot of guilt that comes with not being close when my mom is suffering from these cognitive disorders. And so when I am home, I am tr more conscious and I'm, you know, like, because there's gaps in times and when I see my mother, I'm more attentive, like, did she just forget that? Like, she just told me the same thing over, you know, like I'm more um, cautious, I'm more investigative to make sure like her conditions aren't spiraling to the point where she's not recognizing it, but I need to recognize it. So maybe I need to make a decision to come home or not. And so it's that, uncertainty you know that's that's troubling sometimes but you know as far as stigma as as being a diverse person and, and with my mother I think like she said it's she's she's sort of in a catch-22 because she functions well enough to the point where someone from the outside might say well does she have this issue and obviously they just have a quick snapshot of her. And so I think sometimes with stigma and the medical field, because we don't have the whole person, we don't know this person from birth to the point they are now, we don't see that decline in the slow progression. So it's, it's taking those people serious. Now I think there's a, a big issue right now with African-American women who are dying from pregnancy. And I think they're, they're telling like my pain level and people are not, taking it serious. And I think with stigma from the black community, when we do say we have an issue, sometimes we get criticized for, oh, they're trying to manipulate the systems or, you know, they just want disability or they just want handouts or things like that. And it's perpetuated from long standards of perceptions of the black person of uh, laziness or whatever we've been called. And my mother's not lazy at all. She, she worked multiple jobs when I was young. She's always worked. She's always been a hustler. She's from South Central Los Angeles. She raised me. She did, obviously, 
<laughs> not obviously, but she did a good job. And, you know, she just, she's an advocate for herself and she can be really um, tenacious because people don't take things serious enough for her. And so um, I think as far as stigma in the medical field, and I think what, the way my mom deals with it is she's just more assertive. And she taught me, you know, more. She, she always told me, advocate for yourself, advocate for yourself. Because I'm more uh, introverted, soft spoken. I'm not really um, aggressive in that sense. But I understand for her, she has to be because her son is in Minnesota. You know, her mother is getting older. Her sister is having issues. So sometimes you can feel all alone within that system. And then you have the burden of being a black woman on top of the issues that you currently have. So, you know, I'm glad that we have panels like this where we can have these discussions because I always believe issues, you know, I, I study, you know, politics and, and Aristotle and it's, you know, we have to talk about these things it's, and that will help us to understand one another and see each other's perspective you know, and be free to do those things, to be free to speak what's on our minds without fear of consequence or cancellation. So yeah, I'm, I'm grateful for this opportunity. Uh, like I said, I'm sort of in mental limbo and guilt, but ambition and, you know, so I just, this is the first time I really spoke about it in public. Um, so it, it's a, an emotional topic, obviously, because it's my mother. And it's, it's even harder because I'm not close. But these are the things that I've recognized in her, in the system. And, and I'm so grateful for platforms like this. And um, that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin, for sharing your story and your perspective as part of your mother's care team. Um, you know. Being a long distance caregiver myself, uh, I understand how difficult it is and you know, dealing with the guilt and all those things. And so um, I just want to let you know that you know you're a great, you're a great son and a great person and being there for your mother. So thank you so much. Um, next up, we have Dave Baldridge, uh, who's the executive director of the International Association for Indigenous Aging. Uh, Dave will share his experience living with mild cognitive impairment and how he is also able to thrive in his role there. And so, yeah, go ahead, Dave, whenever you're ready. Dave. Dave, are you there? I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear oh, you. Oh, uh, sorry, I had my mute on. Um, I'm executive director of the International Association for Indigenous Aging, which is uh, the nation's foremost advocate about dementia for American Indians and Alaska Natives around the country. And the first reaction when I was diagnosed with PSP, progressive supranuclear palsy, uh, causing dementia, about two and a half years ago, was how ironic. This is a classic case of a guy leading national dementia initiatives who's got dementia. The emperor has no clothes. And it was very sobering, uh, very humbling. And... I'd like to share with you my experience. I'd live, as I mentioned, I live alone. Uh, and our nonprofit work team has been extraordinarily supportive. And because my daughter, with whom I'm close, lives many states away in New York, I'm in New Mexico, uh, I have relied on my network of colleagues and friends to be my support network. It's virtual, they're not here, uh, but is they have been extraordinarily supportive and fulfilled, I think, a lot of the needs I have that would normally uh, go to my family. I'm also very close, as I mentioned, with my daughter, uh, who 
has lived a, a lifetime with medical issues, but she's that support network, uh, which includes my long distance daughter, has been so supportive. I feel fine. I can pick up a phone 24 seven and reach some one of my colleagues, excuse me, one of my colleagues who I know will be extremely supportive and helpful. And that has made a tremendous amount of difference. So my point, I guess, is it doesn't have to be your blood relatives who are your family. If you're close enough with them, you can uh, rely on your colleagues and your friends. And I do that regularly with phone calls to a couple of my friends and colleagues every day. It's been extremely helpful to me. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. One of the first things I noticed was that I was losing executive function. Oh, pardon me. Um, my ability to attend meetings I was scheduled to be at, my ability to contribute meaningfully to our team meetings was really, really diminished. And once again, I have to hand a feather to my, to my colleagues who've really picked up the slack and have allowed me to continue working as best as best <coughs> excuse me as best i can contributing as much as i can with no pressure to do otherwise uh, again uh, uh, one of the major thoughts that that occurred was that this is really ironic dude you're the head of a national dementia dealing organization and you've got dementia so uh, the point, of course, is that your good friends, if they are tuned in and are supportive of you, can fulfill a lot of the functions that a family would normally fulfill. And so I, I am very grateful for that. <clears throat> One of the first things I noticed was loss of executive function. I find myself missing meetings. I found myself, you know, this is two, two three years ago, I, I found myself unable to keep up with the conversations a little bit and able to contribute less. But that, thanks to my colleagues, has, has not been an enormous barrier. They have allowed me to still represent the organization as I was one of the two founding members 20 years ago. And uh, they've made my life very comfortable with their understanding and patience with me. So, uh, <clears throat> Because, <clears throat> excuse me again, because I do live alone, uh, keeping up with the daily workflow is increasingly a challenge. Uh, I have to work harder, spend more time at it, and continue to try to do my best. I give that try to do my best as my bottom line solution. That I think that's all that any of us who are affected uh, can do. <clears throat> is continue to contribute to the best of our ability. And uh, I, I have found, again, that my friends and colleagues have been extremely supportive, even though I live alone. The second, and if not the foremost issue that happened with the PSP is loss of balance. I live in a very comfortable one-story, 1,800-square-foot home, but I'm able to touch a ledge or a wall uh, almost every step through my house if I need to. So I don't use a wheelchair at home and I'm able to navigate, able still to drive. Um, alertness there has not seemingly been effective, but uh, to get exercise is very difficult when you don't have any balance. So I invested a couple of years ago in a very expensive, but very neat electric wheelchair. It allows me to go out to a rehab center lawn with my dogs every afternoon, climb in my wheelchair and go exercise and play with them. And it's been just extremely rewarding in that respect. So I, I think having dementia and loss of, of balance is not the end of the world. There are ways to compensate if we can be creative enough. And I'm still trying, but uh, there's a constant awareness in the back of my head that, uh, dude, this disease is progressive. 
it's not going to get better. It's going to get worse. It's going to kill you. And so I think the best that I can do, and again, I offer this as maybe the best any of us can do, is to continue to keep trying hard and doing our best and being present. And so far, uh, that's been working out, and I'm just really grateful for it. I, I dread the loss of my cognitive function, which is ongoing, uh, even more than the loss of physical function. Uh, the ability to relate to our family and friends is just so important to us. And so I try to maintain those relationships very strongly. I often call my friends or my daughter every day or every two or three days. And uh, that's been a, a really great surrogate for not having uh, family members living with me or available in my hometown. So uh, I, I do want to make that point. Uh, very clearly. I, I feel that having dementia is, for me, not the end of the world. I just try to assure that I'm not falling down on commitments, on things that, I, that are important to my friends and colleagues. And so I pay a lot of attention to that and a very great deal of attention to ADLs, the activities of daily living which are increasingly a huge challenge for me. Interestingly, uh, I keep and have for many years two tanks of African Malawi cichlids. These are small, very bright, very aggressive fish. And I maintain the tanks carefully and uh, have found a great deal of enjoyment watching them live their lives 20 yards away from my desk chair. Um, the, I think having a hobby like that that really involves us has been a tremendous help, and I would recommend that to anybody. Um, as for the future, you know, I, I have arranged my end of life issues. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> the mortgage for my home uh, and, and other important banking pass along information so that my daughter will be the recipient. And that's been really helpful. It brings a little peace of mind to know that you've got your end of life stuff in order. And uh, I keep that very nearby and find that it's useful to me. So in many respects, it seems that a person with dementia like me can continue to function at a almost normal level, even though the disease is progressing. Uh, again, I, the answer for all of us, I think, is to just stay positive and keep trying the best we can and be a loving friend and good neighbor uh, to the best of our ability. And that's some of the most important stuff in life. So thank you very much for letting me say a few words. Uh, and uh, I, I'm looking forward to hearing the rest of our session. Thank you, Dave, for sharing your story. Um, a lot of folks in the chat were asking if you could turn on your camera, um, but we'll save it for the next portion during the Q&A. Uh, but thank you so much for sharing your story and listening to, to you and how you're, you know, it takes a village of supports and the ones around you to provide care and to be there for you to excel. Uh, in your work as an executive director over at IA Squared. So thank, thank you. you so, I, thank I you do, so much. Thank you very much for this opportunity. I do feel that those, as I said, I guess, those, those friends and colleagues can really help fill the gap that comes from uh, number one, living alone, number two, not having family close by. So uh, as I said, I rely on them very heavily and they've been awesome. I have not found them to be judgmental. Uh, and I, again, because I've been very, very open, I, I have some national prominence as the head of a national organization dealing with dementia across Indian country for the whole nation. It's really ironic that I would be affected by it so profoundly, but uh, I, I'm just grateful for every opportunity and including this one. Thank you again. It, it's truly inspiring and, you know, 
we can't wait to hear more from you during the Q&A session. But um, next up, and finally, we have uh, Jenny Bigger, from the, who's the Executive Director of Communications at Us Against Alzheimer's. Uh, Jenny will be presenting on some of the findings of a recent survey uh, done over at Us Against Alzheimer's to learn more about the perceptions around Alzheimer's disease and related dementia. And so go ahead, Jenny. Thank you. Um, as Ocean said, I'm with Us Against Alzheimer's um, and I lead our What Matters Most research, including the A-List registry. Uh, prior to that, I was a reporter for National Public Radio. And so I manage our, our I now manage our research communication uh, among other aspects of the program. And next slide, please. So I wanna give you a, just a brief overview of Us Against Alzheimer's, an advocacy and research organization uh, in Washington. Uh, we're focused on these three program areas. So early intervention focuses on early diagnosis of dementia, health equity, uh, promoting equity and access through our Brain Health Equity Center, uh, speeding treatments, which focuses on policy issues related to getting treatments to those who need them, and Voices of Alzheimer's, which elevates the stories of those with the disease and caregivers through advocacy and research, and that's where the A-list lives. Next slide, please. So the A-list is a virtual registry, and we have more than 10,000 members who are either living with uh, Alzheimer's disease or related dementia, a people who consider themselves to be at risk for dementia, most often a family connection, uh, caregivers who are both uh, current and, and uh, past caregivers, and also people who are interested in brain health. Um, our study is the ongoing What Matters Most Insight study that scientifically validates the lived experiences of people like Andrea, Kevin, and Dave. Um, and we do that through monthly surveys on a wide range of topics, addressing different aspects uh, of the uh, Alzheimer's and dementia journey. For example, the impact of stigma or what we really refer to as attitudes toward dementia, which we'll hear more about, uh, we've been hearing about and we'll hear more about, um, Symptom, dementia symptoms like agitation or lucidity in dementia. Um, and that actually the lucidity in dementia study is um, something that Dr. Gogler has been involved with. Um, we've done surveys around early detection and diagnosis, caregiver challenges, even the role of faith in dementia or what's it like to travel with dementia. So we really tried to touch on uh, and what matters most to people who are experiencing the disease. Um, the A-list the has the only national study that's producing ongoing longitudinal rapid response data on the opinions and needs of, um, uh, of people living with dementia and caregivers. Um, importantly, we're guided by operating principles that placed the highest priority on respect for and commitment to the needs of people living with dementia and caregivers and our ethical oversight is provided by the IRB um, Advara. And next slide, please. Oh, I'm sorry, not quite. Uh, just one more uh, point about the res our uh, survey results. Um, we use anonymous results. Um, we publish in various forms, peer reviewed journals, reports, even social media, other formats in order to inform people like attendees in this webinar, public health leaders, um, other policymakers, researchers, healthcare providers, and other uh, stakeholders. And next slide, please. So in the survey that we're talking about today, we set out to better understand attitudes toward dementia uh, and stigma. And we were pleased to develop the survey with several individuals, uh, which we often do partner with um, academic and other partners, uh, including Ocean Lee of Diverse Elders Coalition, Dr. Fayron Epps of Emory uh, School of Nursing, Dr. Lauren Parker of Johns Hopkins. Um, and the survey was also fielded in partnership with De Dementia Friendly Nevada as well. Um, I'll start with an overview of the survey results um, and then give you a, a snapshot of some more detail in, in each of the res main respondent groups. So we had uh, 682 respondents, 
uh, the great majority were, were women, 74% uh, identify as female, about 62% are over age 65, 32% between age 51 and 65, uh, so an older respondent group, and 14% were non-Caucasian. The sample um, was, was, was too small to really compare uh, differences by ethnicity and race. But um, so looking first at respondents who uh, I said they were living with dementia or MCI, um, overall, this group reported relatively modest stigma and mostly related to feeling left out of things, seeing that people are uncomfortable with them uh, and embarrassment about their illness or their limitations. Um, the caregiver respondent group, these are again, both current caregivers and, and, and past caregivers, reported more types of stigma than other respondent groups. Um, in particular, they noticed reduced social contacts for both themselves and the care recipient. Many observe that the diagnosed person is treated differently by family, healthcare providers, and others. And they believe that the diagnosis will or did affect the person with dementia's function as a spouse, a parent, um, and a grandparent. Also, over half of this respondent group said they do feel some guilt. And the last uh, respondent, uh, last group of, of respondents is not directly affected by dementia. Uh, that includes people who identify as being at risk for the disease or interested in, in brain health. And these groups reported generally having very positive feelings about diagnosed individuals, as well as working, interacting with them. Uh, only 9% of this respondent group said they were afraid of individuals with dementia, um, but 46% did say uh, they avoid an agitated person and feel somewhat frustrated about not knowing how to help. So would like more information about how to be supportive of people with dementia. And slide, uh, Next slide, please. So now just uh, show just some more detail on kind of key questions um, across these groups, um, starting with uh, people living with dementia or MCI. Uh, they were asked to rate the statement, because of my illness, I feel left out of things. 30% said never, 22% said rarely, 30% sometimes, with only 7% saying often, 6% saying always, and a small number saying not applicable or maybe skip this question. And next slide, please. Uh, these respondents were also asked to rate the question, because of my illness, people are unkind to me. And 59% said never, 24% said rarely, just 7% said sometimes, 2% said often or always. And next slide, please. And um, again, this group was asked to rate the question, I feel embarrassed about my illness. 35% said never, 17% said rarely, 30% said sometimes, with 11% saying often and 6% saying always. And next slide, please. And um, now looking at caregiver responses, um, caregivers were asked, to what extent did or do you experience a reduction in your social contacts after the diagnosis of the person you're caring for? 10% said not at all, 12% small extent, 16% to some extent, 22% said moderate extent, with 28% saying always. So you do see that impact there for, for caregivers in their social social community. And next slide, please. Um, caregivers were at, uh, also asked, to what extent do or did you feel that the person is treated differently by family members since uh, the diagnosis, something Andrea mentioned? Um, nine, just 9% 9 said not at all. 15% though said to a small extent. 19% said to some extent. 19% also said to a moderate extent with 33% saying always. And next slide, please. Um, and finally in this group, oh no, not quite finally, but so the uh, caregivers were also asked to what extent do or did you feel guilty about the person's situation? 44% um, said not at all, uh, but 19% said to a small extent, 
15% to some extent, 11% to moderate extent, 10% saying always. So more than half saying that they feel at least some guilt. Uh, and next slide, please. Um, lastly, in this caregiver group, they were asked, uh, to what extent uh, do or did you think the diagnosis will affect the person's functioning as a spouse? And just 1% said not at all or to a small extent, with 6% saying some extent, 11% saying moderately, 58% uh, saying always, 25% uh, saying not applicable or declined to answer. And next slide, please. I'll just give you a couple of examples from this last group who said they were either interested in brain health or believe they're at risk for dementia. And overall, this, these groups uh, have a positive view of their own attitudes toward dementia, as well as people living with dementia. Um, they were asked to rate the question, is it possible to enjoy interacting with people with dementia? Just 2% strongly disagree, 1% dis disagree, 1% somewhat disagree, 4% neutral, 14% agreeing somewhat, 48% saying they agree, and 30% saying they strongly agree. And next slide, please. Uh, this group was also asked to rate the question, we can do a lot now to improve the lives of people with dementia. A very small number, 2% strongly disagreeing, 1% either disagreeing or somewhat disagreeing, 4% saying they were neutral, 14% somewhat agreeing with the statement, 48% agreeing, and 30% strongly agreeing. So um, you, this is really just the top line results. Um, you can see this, the complete results uh, in our Pulse of the Community report which I can put in a link to that in the chat. Um, but thank you so much for the opportunity to talk about this work. Um, and particularly for me, it's so uh, uh, powerful to think about this and in relation and connection to the stories we've heard from Andrea, uh, Kevin and Dave. So thank you very much, Ocean and everyone. Definitely, thank you. Jenny, for sharing that presentation. Uh, I'm sure the findings captured in the survey reflect um, many of the experience, experiences of those living with MCI dementia um, and also perspectives from their caregivers. And so thank you so much for that. Um, at this point, um, I would like to uh, invite all panelists to um, share their videos. Um, you know, we're going into the Q&A session. Um, and so, uh, yeah, just wanna make sure that you all are there to answer these questions. Um, with that being said, I'll pass it on to my colleague, Chelsea Klein, uh, who'll be moderating the Q&A session. And so go ahead, Chelsea, take it away. Hi, everyone. My name is Chelsea Klein. I'm an Associate Director of Centers of Excellence at the Alzheimer's Association and uh, work closely with the Center of Excellence on Caregiving and a lot of our, our stakeholder work. So I'm so excited to be here today to moderate the Q&A. Thank you so much for the center and the Health Equity Task Force for putting this on. And um, to Jenny, thanks so much for sharing those really interesting results. And huge thank you to Andrea, Kevin, and Dave for sharing your experiences. Um, so we do have a few prepared questions that we'll be um, asking first, and then if you do have other questions from the audience, if you have questions, please feel free to put those into the Q&A chat. Um, and then if we have time, we'll answer as, as many of those audience questions as possible. So to get started, um, you know, after hearing those results from the A-list survey that Jenny just shared, Dave, Kevin, and Andrea would love to hear your initial reactions to the survey results um, related to stigma and attitudes about dementia. Were those surprising to, to you or do those resonate with your own personal experiences? Um, Andrea, would you like to share first? Sure, um, definitely uh, resonated with my own experience and they were pretty much on the money in regards to um, the way um, they were answered, uh, especially when it comes to stigma. Stigma. So. 
great. Thank you. Sorry, I think my internet just went out. Okay, I'm back now. Um, Kevin, what about you? Did those, what did you think about those results? What were your, your initial reactions to those? My initial reactions were I agree with a lot of results. I wasn't too surprised by anything. So yeah, I was pretty much uh, in, in agreement with the results. Great, thank you. And Dave, what about you? What were your initial reactions to those results? I, uh, if anything, I found people to be more accepting and understanding than I had expected. And I think if we're forthright and give people a chance that they'll often really step up with us. Thank you. All right, thank you so much. So now I kind of want to move into things that, um, or ideas about what public health um, or agencies, community-based organizations can start to do to help combat those negative attitudes or stigmas related to dementia and MCI. Um, so to get started, do you all think a helpful kind of first step in combating that stigma is just greater education on brain health and Alzheimer's and MCI in general? Do you think there's kind of a, a um, a need for more education on just general brain health um, in the general public? I would say definitely yes. We've had a very good response in Indian communities, but it relies on us being able to educate the elders and the caregivers uh, about the nature of this disease and uh, how it affects all of us. Thank you. Thank you. Kevin, what are your thoughts? I guess as far as stigma within marginalized communities, like greater education for, you know, brain health would be great, you know, in, in those areas where that topic is probably not talked about that often, or if it is, it's not linked with dementia or cognitive impairment, it's probably linked with something else. And so, uh, a, a greater education for it in general is and in and navigating systems as well like for marginalized people is is a little bit more difficult and so maybe even having um uh, almost like social workers that can can help people navigate those systems on an individual basis would be uh great as well that's a great point Thank you. And Andrea, what about you? Do you think that education would help? Yeah, can you repeat the question again? Sure. So do you think that providing the public with more information about brain health in general would help to kind of combat stigma or negative perceptions of Alzheimer's and MCI? Yeah, so my, my take is a little different. I think the, the issue is that there's enough information out there. I feel like um, um, the agencies are failing the community, um, underserved community. The funds are there, the people are there, but it's failing uh, marginalized people in general, and no one wants to talk about it. Um, so I think if, if, if these agencies can focus on their own stigmas, stigmas that they portray onto other people, it would be a better start instead of it being the opposite. It is though we're the issue. The issues is coming from the agency. We're talking, we're talking century. That means a hundred years. We're talking decades. That means 10 years. Um, and to keep having this conversation is unacceptable. Uh, we know what needs to be done. They've done enough research. They've done it, they've done enough um um, you know, you know, research and, you know, information, um, but what, what are we doing with that information? So the stigma is coming from within. When you walk into an office that's supposed to be helping people with cognitive issues and um, dementia, and you walk through the office and you see nothing but a certain color at MLMs and they're not diverse, why are we still hiring people that's not diverse when we know it's an issue. So the issue is coming from inside. And so we need to 
make sure we have a pack of MLMs of different communities, Native American, African American, Chinese American. When, we, when I walk into an office, when I walk into an Alzheimer's office, I want to see a diversity. We've been dealing with this for a long time. So the issue is what are the health, um, the uh, public health doing about that issue? Because if we can get more MLMs of different flavors, then they can be more helpful in our community. Thank you so much. I think that is such an important point. Um, and kind of related to that, I would love to hear also from, from Dave and Kevin, you know, what are, what are some other things, in our, Andrea, of course, other things you think public health should be doing? We heard some great ideas from Andrea just now, but what are some other things that public health should be doing to kind of start that, that move forward in, in combating stigma? <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Across Indian country, <coughs> pardon me, come back to me in a second. Yes, of course. I think um, as far as employment and diversity, maybe I, I was watching something, they were talking about TikTok and how American society has a uh, TikTok in Asian culture is different than TikTok in American culture. Rather in Asia, TikTok is more influenced with what children can become, like become this and, and education where ours is more uh, social media, entertainment. And so if we can do early education for children so they can be aware that dementia exists and maybe begin a profession within that industry because a lot of industries are not even spoken of in inner cities or marginalized communities, like the topic of, you know, working with these uh, type of issues. There's mostly um, just medical and in general, like, you know, so maybe, you know, going to inner, uh, inner cities and, and, and bringing people who work with dementia and saying, well, this is an opportunity for you to help us in this, this um, environment, like a, a job fair almost, or, um, you know how they used to have take my child to uh, take my parent to work day like it's sort of like a presentation of so I'm this and I work with the dementia persons or persons with cognitive disorders maybe you can be interested and we can start that conversation earlier and then maybe there'll be more hiring and diversity later. That's great. Thank you so much. I'm sorry. Um, across Indian country, the nation's 570-something tribes have been literally overwhelmed with COVID, and it has consumed the Indian health care delivery system, which our tribes, Indian Health Service, um, and consequently, uh, we need to normalize dementia among our populations and make people realize that it, it's not an outlier. It's something that a person can still live a productive and relatively normal life while experiencing. Thank you. Thanks, Dave. And uh, Andrea, any other kind of thoughts about what you think agencies or organizations can do to continue combating those negative perceptions or stigma? Yes, okay, I'm gonna give an example. Uh, and I, I like to give examples because it helps people stick. So do you guys see this, this box uh, on waffles? Okay. So one of the things I think it would be helpful is that we see a lot of brochure advertising in regards to what we're going to do as agency. We see this. It looks good. It's polished. It has colors. It has people of different community. But then when you open it up, again, this plastic represents certain um, workers, majority white workers. You hardly see any diversity, okay? And then inside you see a waffle. So the waffle represent that this is what the agency is, is going to do. But again, they're failing us. They're not doing the work. They're, they're showing a packet, you know, um, where it looks good and then there's no diversity in the workplace and then 
people like me are not getting the, the meat of the, um, the services. So me living alone, a lot of the resources that I have received is me going out doing my own research. People that I know that I've lived next door to, maybe an aunt, maybe a cousin that have cognitive functioning or dementia, they're doing a lot of the work themselves. So the question is, what are the agencies really doing? Okay, we, we, I, my, myself, I'm tired of the pretty packaging. I'm tired of working, I'm tired of walking into an office and it's just uh, a certain race of people and they're trying to reach me. And I'm tired of um, not getting the meat and potato of what I need as an individual. So what are uh, you guys doing to do some proactive, active work? And so that's the question. Uh, we really need to take those funds and really use them for people like myself or my son that need the assistance to help me and me need the, the assistance to navigate through these health systems and things like that. So we need to focus more on the meat and potato um, of the help of the people that need it and not the packaging. That's great. I love that example, Andrea. Thanks for, for sharing that. And I think you, you all are bringing up just really, really important points. Um, so thank you so much for sharing. We do have a question from a member of the, the audience. And I think, Ocean, you're going to let them ask their question, correct? Yeah, um, Michael, uh, you are not, you could now uh, feel free to ask your question. I unmuted you and so uh, far away. Thank you so much. I really appreciate everybody's comments here today, especially to hear Andrea speak. Uh, it, it, it's to me very powerful to have the person who is living with the disease to speak up and share their viewpoints and to be able to be allowed to express themselves, which does not seem to happen too often. I also like the statistics that Ginny has shared, and it, I think it goes to show you while we're talking about education, so much more education is needed in order to break down a lot of this stigma. And I hope a lot is taken away from that because I am living with dementia. And I think that as we get better at educating people, the stigma will go away. But it all starts with the doctors and so many other people that are just misguided on what it really means to truly have dementia. I mean, Andrea and I look very well. You can't tell there's something wrong with us. But believe me, in our minds, there's a lot going on. And we need a lot of help from a lot of people to go through the normal life course. And I, I, I just hope more people will understand that and to allow us to long live, long live in our communities and to continue to be at least as functional as possible within our limitations. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing, Michael. All right, so we do have another question from one of the attendees um, and they ask, when it came to getting um, your diagnosis and feedback on the diagnosis from medical providers, what was helpful for you to hear from them in terms of, um, you know, things you needed to do or just like advice from them after your diagnosis? What was helpful to hear from medical providers? I would say uh, in Indian country that Providers, uh, I'll use a word I used before, normalize. They can help us understand that dementia is not a totally debilitating state and that people can still live valuable lives while experiencing dementia. And the providers in our healthcare delivery system needs to really keep that in mind. Thank you. So I would say the neurologist that I had, he was a young guy, so he was really inspirational. And he was like, this is not a death sentence. Um, you know, you still stay active, things like that. Um, but honestly, um, the neurologist can only do so much. I had to take the information home and figure out and figure it all out. 
you know, uh, make sure that I put things in place, which I did. Uh, and that was like several years ago. So I had to come home and say, okay, what am I going to do? You know, I knew that I need to be closer to family. So I made a decision. It was a very hard decision to move back to California. I, I had to keep my son in the loop. And then I had to get myself in order um, in regards to, um, you know, the things that I was responsible for so that it wouldn't be too much for myself. So I had to walk out of that office and do the work. And sometimes people don't have um, that capacity to do that. And so um, they need to know that there's places they can go to help them navigate through that. Um, but the neurologist did as much as he could on a medical sense. Thank you. And was there anything that was not helpful to you upon getting your diagnosis? Um, that medical provider shared with you? Is there anything that you didn't, you kind of wish you didn't, they didn't tell you or it just <laughs> wasn't helpful? I mean, it was hard to understand the language, you know, uh, some of the language maybe I didn't really need, maybe I needed more like, this is mild cognitive disorder, this is the prognosis of it, um, you know, maybe this is how it's going to affect you uh, on a daily basis. Um, so yeah, there wasn't really nothing that I didn't need. Oh yeah. He, um, encouraged me to continue with the, um, you know, the, um, the evaluation, the testing at least yearly, that was very helpful. Um, because your diagnosis change all the time. Mine just changed, you know? Um, so that was really, really helpful. Um, so it wasn't really, from my perspective, it wasn't a lot of things that was not helpful. Um, the less information for me is good. <laughs> Great, thank you. And another kind of similar question is, if you were kind of talking to someone who was newly diagnosed, is there something that you wish that you had known when you were newly diagnosed um, that you kind of hope others will have in the future? Like what's something that you wish you knew? or resources you wish you had when you were newly diagnosed? I think Andrea, you're muted if you were speaking. Okay, I don't know if that question was directed to me or if Dave wanted to um, collaborate on that. I don't know if it was. Yeah, Dave, do you have any, is there anything you wish you knew um, or things that were helpful to know kind of at early diagnosis that you think would be helpful for others who may be newly diagnosed? It turns out as uh, the greatest help came when I met my neurologist, who is very accomplished, that helped me understand that there is not going to be a cure for this. We have to deal with the issues one by one or deal with the problems and don't fight the big picture every time. Uh, we've just got to deal with our personal issues with it. Thank you. Thank you. So what I would say, um, one of the things I wish I would have known, because I was starting to have some cognitive issue, um, I really couldn't really work. Um, it would have been really good to have someone help me navigate through the Social Security disability um, benefits. It took me eight years to get Social Security, SSDI, um, seven years in Virginia and one year in California. And the whole time, a total eight years, I advocate for myself 7.5 of that percent. I think I had a, a, a lawyer, I had lawyers and I, I fired them and I did the majority of the work myself. I wish I had an advocate that was able to help me through that. And then once I got into California, I was able to get in-home supportive services. Again, I had to advocate for myself. Um, it would have been nice to have, and that's where the money should go, help us navigate through these systems, not the agency themselves, but have a proactive, up-to-date system where people like myself, especially if you're single, someone that can help us um, navigate through this. Because sometimes, I think Kevin mentioned this, is that sometimes family members, they're just not knowledgeable about these things. Um, I, there was many nights that I had to stay up late at night to try to figure out some resources for myself to make my life a little more easier. Um, so, and I did, and like I said, right now I get about 15 hours a month and I can do a hundred percent of things by myself, but the help that I get 
lower my anxiety, it lowers my stressors so that I don't have more cognitive issue. And so I wish I had someone that were able to, uh, system that was able to help me. And there's no systems out there. There's nothing. Yeah. Thank you, Andrea. And Kevin would love to hear your perspective on this. Um, is there anything as, you know, you, your mom was going through the, the diagnosis process or when she was newly diagnosed, is there anything you that you knew? Um, I didn't understand the severity of the, what dementia or cognitive impairment was just from a mechanics perspective or what to expect in the future. I remember in general, like my information of what dementia was came from like movies and TV shows. And so I remember working in the VA hospital and dealing with dementia, I didn't realize the severity of it as far as so it gets to the point where you you don't you forget how to eat. Like I didn't know it was that severe. And then I didn't realize how um, there was part of the war where um, people were just like cussing and just just and they were saying that this person who's behaving this way was never like this as she was living without the disease. And so how it can just totally alter your personality and you can just be uh, just speaking uh, sporadically and just almost like you have to rest. And I didn't recognize that it had gotten, it can get that severe because the only education, like I said, that I ever knew of dementia was just watching movies and where it's, you know, it's a scene where, you know, I'm your, I'm your son, I'm your daughter. And then it's like the next scene. So I didn't understand that it got to the point where you forget how to eat. And so then it becomes, um, so what do I do? You know, what are, what are my responsibilities? I know I can't change the situation. And then I didn't know, um, I heard not only uh, is it not curable, but I thought that it wasn't even diagnosable until after the person was um, pronounced dead. And I may be wrong about that information, but I really don't, I really didn't know. So I think um, not knowing just the mechanics of it, just not understanding what it means in general. Um, so if I had more education on it, I would be able to better deal with it when it, when it starts to get more severe over the years. Cause right now it's like, I have to figure it out on my own because there's, um, there's no like, I guess when, the medical field is just addressing my mother's concerns. So, I mean, there's nothing that's like, as a family, you should, you know, like, so I just get the information from my mom, like these are my symptoms and now I have to figure out, so what do I do? What, what should I expect? You know, what, you know, plan should I put in motion? And so all those things have to come on my own. So maybe if there is um, more of a family component, you know, not only if it's, you know, I know that each patient has their own um, privacy rights, but if they are amendable towards those, they can say, you know what, can I bring my son in? Can you speak to him about what he or she should do? I think that would be extremely helpful. Thank you so much. That is super helpful to hear. Um, well, I think we have time for one last question. This is also a question from one of our attendees in the audience. And she asks, um, she says, as a white woman with mostly clients of color, is there any specific advice you think white providers need to hear? Here I go. <laughs> Thank you so much for even bringing that up. I think Kevin mentioned this early. I think sometimes being a, a, a black person or a person of color, you know, whether it's Native America, Chinese America, we're not taken seriously, first of all. Just the mere fact that we are, you know, we look different. Uh, and I think taking everybody seriously, it, it doesn't matter if they're they're white, Chinese, or black, just However, when that person shows up in front of you, take them serious, whatever they need. Like, you know, if they're having cognitive issues, um, if they're having family issue, if they're having resource issue, take that person serious because that's where the inequality come from. That's when the um, marginalized come from. Marginalized mean seeing a person as insignificant. I had to look that up. You hear all these terms, 
you know, rolling around. I'm one of those type of person. I had to break it down. I had to go into the dictionary and kind of break it down. So marginalized people mean someone seeing a group of people or individual as insignificant. And I think agency needs to start seeing people as significant, just being born into this universe. They are significant. Doesn't matter what color they are. And so I, I'm glad that she brought that up. And I think that everyone that's on this call, we have to do our part. I have to do my part to see each everyone as a significant being. And that would shift behaviors and perceptions and all that stuff. Um, you know, hey, this person, you know, co being colorblind, this person needs help. They, they need my assistance. I have the funds. I have the resources as a worker, as a professional, and this person with this condition need my help. And it's not my job to determine where these funds should go because I have a belief that they're insignificant. So I think everybody on that other side should see everyone as important. So thank you for bringing that up. The word we use for it is humility. Uh, providers need large doses of this rather than uh, uh, presuming a top-down situation. Thank you. And Kevin, any, any thoughts on that before we close out? I guess in general, dealing with stigma, I think we all have our own biases. And so just recognizing that we have those biases, but not trying to make decisions based off those stereotypes and rather trying to see the person as a whole rather than like assuming. It was just, uh, especially with African-Americans, we just been stigmatized and stereotyped for so long. And sometimes those biases affect the way that we deal with, each, you know, we're, we're dealt with. And so just recognizing that, you know, we're, we're all individuals that have our own stories and that we're not all classified in one box of this is a black person. So thus all blacks or, you know, we're all individuals that have, you know, and treating people holistically, you know? And so I think just recognizing that we have biases and just not making decisions based off of those. Thank you so much. And thank you to our panelists for this amazing Q&A session. I know I learned so much and I know everyone else on the call I'm sure did too. So thank you again for your insights and, and your answers. And we really appreciate all of your thoughts. Thank you. Thank you, Chelsea, for moderating that. Um, and that concludes our Q&A session. Uh, I know there's some outstanding questions and I'm sure we'll get together after this to think about ways to best address those uh, questions. Um, uh, can someone pull up the, the slide deck? I don't know if you're there. Um, but yeah, um, but yeah, just going off of what I said earlier, I just want to thank all the panelists today who shared their stories, Jenny, who shared that wonderful presentation. Um, you know, it takes a lot of courage to talk about these experiences and your stories today. Jenny's presentation today reminds us of how much work needs to be done to resolve and address the negative attitudes and stigma associated with dementia, not just in the US, but globally, um, as we identified this as a uh, global problem. Um, yeah, here are some future events uh, to look out for. Um, you know, we'll be doing a webinar in January on the newly released Raise National Strategy for Caregivers. Uh, Nashby also recently released a roadmap for state and local legislators uh, with resources for funding opportunities and how to leverage existing funding opportunities to support those living with dementia and mild cognitive impairment. Uh, we also have a virtual roadmap, uh, round, virtual round, round table series on successful public health approaches in dementia caregiving. So uh, look out for that as well. Next slide, please. Um, and finally, connect with us. Um, I think there should be a link uh, to a brief survey uh, shared in the chat. Uh, if you don't see that uh, link to the survey, it'll be it'll, the same server will pop up as soon as the Zoom closes. Um, also, visit us online um, uh, through Twitter, as you can see here. 
and also our website. Uh, we have a ton of uh, resources on our website uh, for both public health officials, aging professionals, and those and caregivers of those living with dementia. Uh, I know a lot of folks asked about resources and whatnot, and so please feel free to check out our website at the top there. Um, and then you can also connect with us on Twitter. Uh, our handle is, I think it, it was on the last slide as well. We'll be sending out re a recording where you could uh, see our Twitter handle. Uh, all of our events are usually promoted on Twitter. And so uh, it's a good place to keep up to date with all the activities of the Bold Public Health Center of Excellence on Dementia Caregiving. And so, uh with that being said keep in touch thank you all for being here thank you to all our panelists uh feel free to reach out to any of us if you have any additional questions after the webinar thank you bye everyone thank you thank you